This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I'd now like to welcome uh, Catherine Eagleton, who formerly, as she said, of the British Museum, is now Head of Asian African Studies at the British Library. She's going to be speaking on global questions about objects and archives, understanding how, when and why the Indian rupee became the currency of East Africa. Thank you. Um, the title of this session about getting away from documents, it feels a little bit like I, in the last year or so, have kind of run towards documents by joining a library from a museum. But what I want to talk about today is the importance of being quite careful about how you think about documents and objects in relation to each other, and also about where the source is for what looks like a really tiny, tiny question might be. I thought I'd start with a map, because Zanzibar is one of those mythical places that everybody's heard of. Some people can place on a map, a lot of people maybe can't. It's right in the middle there, and you can see from the way this map's done, it's at the kind of end point of a lot of the trade routes going in and out of the, the central parts of Africa. And then, of course, there are links across the sea, up towards the north to the Gulf, um, across to India, down to Madagascar, and down to the Cape. So it's this incredibly well-connected place. And in the first half of the 19th century, those connections were making it very rich. It was very connected to all those places. There was a lot of activity by European and American merchants, as well as Gulf traders, Indian traders. And by about 1840, the Sultan of Oman and Zanzibar had relocated his capital to Zanzibar because of its increasing importance. About that time, the most important kind of European and American trading nation were the Americans at Zanzibar. The French were there, the Germans were there, and the British had political influence, but actually very little in the way of kind of financial interest. Although, we'll come to the British Indian question in a minute. These are some figures from 1859 from a report that the British consul sent back to London. And you can see the scale of the trade with different countries. Obviously, the trade with the coast is huge because Zanzibar's economy mostly is an import-export trade where things are brought into Zanzibar and then re-exported to the coast and vice versa. Big warning about this slide is the consul admitted when he sent this table that the figures it was based on were incredibly dodgy. There were no centralised customs records because the customs were farmed out to an Indian merchant who wouldn't show him the books. So it was compiled from things the consuls themselves kept and guesstimates. So I guess my first warning is relying on these kinds of figures, which has been done in the past, is really problematic. But what it does show is the general pattern and the balance between the different places trading with Zanzibar and the importance of this re-export trade. In terms of my question for today, the table's denominated in Maria Theresa Talas, which for those of you who don't know, you'll see one in a minute, they're a big silver coin, which was issued first in the late 18th century in Vienna, but ended up being used as the kind of trade currency for the whole of the Middle East area and large parts of Africa. And in a way, if I'm thinking about money, why the currency of East Africa, this, this is a kind of record that tells us about money. It's an account at the very sort of top level of the import-export trade. This is also a record of money, a document about money. It's a transaction log. It's a bit later, but it's the same kind of thing. But this is the kind of money I'm talking about today. It's the stuff, the coins that circulate. And I think I wanted to make this point about the difference between money as record, money as document, and money as object. Because quite often, when you think about the history of money, it's, it's firmly bracketed in economic history, and it becomes tables. And that's a really interesting way of looking at it, but there's something about looking at the objects which I think gets you into a different set of questions. Money is a commodity when you think about it in coin form. So its consignments appear in the very import-export records that will normally be kind of considered as money. These are big silver coins, not this big in reality, thankfully, <laughs> but it has to move around. So you have crates that have to move on ships. So there can be shortages, there can be surpluses. And there can be problems, of course, with credit and transfers and paper-based money. But big lumps of metal, big consignments of lumps of metal have more issues with the practicalities of moving them around. And then the last thing is, for me, a coin passes hand to hand. So you can use it as a way of looking at networks. Um, alongside looking at things like credit networks, but it does something interesting about the way you think about connections and disconnections. So, 1859 Zanzibar, what was the, what was the currency situation when that table was compiled? 
And the answer is it's complicated. There were multiple currencies in use, there were commodities being used to make a lot of exchanges, and there were substantial credit arrangements. So Indian merchants particularly would, let, would give consignments of trade goods like beads, cloth, wire, which operated as currencies in, inland in Africa. Traders would take those off on caravans, come back, and then there'd be a split of the profits. There was also cash-based payments going on, mostly in talas. What's perhaps surprising is that in the same report, the British consul said that almost all the foreign trade was in the hands of British Indian subjects. So you're thinking, OK, why isn't this the currency of Zanzibar in the 1860s? If, if 5,000 Indian merchants and moneylenders control almost all of the foreign trade, why isn't it the rupee? Um, and you might also be thinking, well, this question about how did the rupee become the currency of East Africa, it's obvious, you're thinking. We shouldn't need 20 minutes to explain this. It's because of the Indian merchants, daft, you know. But actually, looking at this, what looked like a really tiny question, looking at it really carefully, you start to see that it's in spite of the Indian merchants, not because of them. And it becomes a story about competition between the different European powers and the American consul at Zanzibar. And it has much more to do with that, ultimately, than it does about any kind of, of the sort of connections and networks that get talked about in relation to this. So I'm going to start, as so often happens when anybody's talking about the mid-19th century East Africa, with Richard Burton. He's famous, of course, for his expedition to Central Africa, and we, he borrowed money and supplies from the customs master, Ludo Damji, and he repaid him by a draft of 5,000 rupees on Bombay. And that was pretty standard. So merchants, moneylenders at, at Zanzibar would advance commodities, currencies, mixtures of both, on drafts on Bombay. There were these networks in place. But Burton's very clear that the rupee was not in circulation, that the tala was the main currency, and also that some of the coins that were technically in circulation just didn't work. So French five franc coins, big silver coin, around about the same size as the rupee, could only pass at about a 10% discount. The Spanish eight reales pillar dollars, the kind of pieces of eight of pirate fame, were there at Zanzibar, but their value fluctuated hugely. They were basically only used when there was seasonal demand for money to be sent north. And that whole other paper that I'm going to do in one sentence has to do with the East Asian trade, because it's all going in through Bombay. Bullion in the form of coin was a lot of it being imported. About 750 Maria Theresa Thalers worth imported from France and Hamburg. And about half of that re-exported to India and Singapore. But remember what I said about the figures being really dodgy. <coughs> The thing you can't get at in any of these documents is what the small change was. You know, what if you don't want to spend a whole tala, which is quite a high value thing, what you make the change in. There were some copper Indian coins in circulation, there was millet used. But one thing I've done which has been really interesting is used early dictionaries and recording, recordings um, of Swahili stories to look at language. Because that indicates that silver coins were cut up into pieces to make small change. So there's something about the way these coins are used. I mean, these nice ones in collections, if I just go back to the tala, something like this could potentially be cut into pieces to make change, which tells you something interesting immediately about what's going on on the ground that you don't necessarily get just from the documents. But what happens then at the start of the southwest monsoon, I'm going to go back to the map, is the boats are preparing to go northwards. And so there's suddenly a big demand for coin. And there are two different kinds of coin demanded. Talas are wanted for the Gulf and for the Middle East and for Somaliland. And Spanish-American dollars, preferably not Mexican, but the other type, I mean, there's real differentiation going on, are wanted for, for sending off to Bombay, and from there they were sent on to East Asia, as I said. So there's a big premium on those coins at that time of year. And Indian money changers made quite large amounts of money from this. They hoarded particular coins when they were abundant in the slack period, and then at the beginning of the monsoon would sell the coins on to the traders who needed them. So rather unsurprisingly, it wasn't them who started trying to push for the fixing of the rates of the coins to stabilize this multiple currency system. The first sort of group of merchants who tried to do that were the French. And the reason for that is that they couldn't compete on imports with several of the other countries. They couldn't compete with the Germans, who brought in brass, and, um, brass wire and beads, which were very popular on the mainland. They couldn't compete with American and Indian merchants who imported cloth. So they had to find something they could import. 
and they imported their silver coins, which of course were also in use further south in Madagascar and at Réunion and in the Comores. And they tried from the 1840s onwards to push the Sultan into fixing a value for these coins because they got sick of them being discounted. And what I find really interesting here is there's a record of the Sultan calling a meeting of the merchants because he said he couldn't act without their agreement. And they refused. They said, no, you know, we don't want to take these coins. They're not worth it. Um, and the Sultan wouldn't act without them. He personally agreed to take French coin at a slightly higher rate, but that just reduced the customs bill. It didn't really help. And the American consul wrote that that attempt had failed in the face of, quote, steadfast Indian opposition. The Indian merchants and money changers sought to protect their profits, basically. But despite that, he also had a go. He tried to persuade the Sultan that the values of Spanish, American, and Portuguese coins should be fixed, and yet again failed. There was another meeting of the merchants, the powerful customs master weighed in, and basically the whole thing was stopped again. And the argument that's recorded for why they didn't want this was not just to do with profit on exchange, but the merchants were worried that if American coins were introduced as currency at Zanzibar, rather than just circulating as lumps of silver that could be bought and sold, then the merchants would no longer bring Marikani cloth. And so they didn't want that because they made profit on supplying the cloth onto the mainland. So what we've got is a situation where different commodities are affecting each other and affecting what looks like a sort of really technical decision about what currency is in use. But then that all changes, and it all changes because of the American Civil War. Um, American ships couldn't import cottons anymore to the same degree, and there were a smaller number of American ships visiting Zanzibar. So to fill the gap in the cotton market, which was the most important of all these commodities, German merchants began importing English cotton goods. And that then reduced the number of talas in circulation because the talas had been coming in from Hamburg. So suddenly the money market is flooded with French five franc coins, which were the least favorable of all the silver coins that there were at Zanzibar. And the Indian merchants were now losing money quite fast rather than profiting. So suddenly there's a kind of convergence of interests the merchants are persuaded to act. The Sultan calls another meeting, and at that they agree on a fix of the rates between the coins. Now, crucially, neither America nor Britain had a resident consul at that time, so their coins weren't included in the fix. So it started with the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese coins. But of course, the French consul was happy. He'd finally secured a rate at close to par value for the French coin. The British consul, not so happy. And he wrote to Bombay that when he returned to Zanzibar, he was, quote, struck by the advantage which would accrue to Indian merchants by having the rupee in currency, quote. So he went to the Sultan, persuaded him to add the rupee to the list, and managed to persuade him to add it at a premium over its intrinsic value, so at 2% higher than its actual value as silver. The Sultan's proclamation made it clear that this is 1863, there were no rupees in circulation because it ends with the line, as soon as rupees shall arrive in the Zanzibar market, from that date their value shall be as specified. So it's a very, it's a, they're, in, they're there in theory before they're there in practice. And of course the American consul's keen not to be left behind, went to see the Sultan and persuaded him to have American gold coins accepted and fixed in their rate to the Maria Teresa Terla. And he also got around about a 2% premium on their intrinsic value. So, We've got this situation where because of the American Civil War and, and fluctuations in the, in the cotton trade, suddenly all the prices are fixed for all these currencies that had floated and fluctuated really significantly. By 1865, it's clear that very large quantities of rupees had come in from Bombay and the British consul reported they were now abundant and were driving out all other kinds of coin. Talas were being used to send money up to the Middle East, but they were not in circulation at Zanzibar anymore, and they could only be purchased actually at a premium because the demand for export was now so high. And the circulating currency within two years had become American gold and Indian rupees, instead of being Talas and a smattering of Spanish-American dollars. So I guess one of my first points that I want to make before I get onto the point about archives and objects and documents again is that the tension between different merchant communities in the 1840s and 50s all sort of came together in the early 1860s because of something that had happened thousands of miles away, the outbreak of war, where you know, fewer Americani cottons are imported, so more English cotton is imported, so fewer talas are imported, so there's losses, and so the rates get fixed. 
And actually, what looks like a tiny technical question starts to show how connected somewhere like Zanzibar was in this period to this great big international network. How am I doing in time? Perfect. By about the 1880s, just to sort of jump forward to conclude, it's clear from the various records and letters and things that someone who had a bill denominated in Talas in Zanzibar, because accounts were still kept in Talas, wouldn't pay it in Talas even if they had them. They would change them into rupees, pay the bill in rupees, and then the payment would be recorded in Talas. So this brings me back to my point about documents and objects, is if you don't actually get at this quite carefully, you could just see Talas being the money of accounts all the way through, and then see, oh, hang on, why is the rupee suddenly made the currency of Zanzibar when the protectorate is declared in the 1890s? You'd suddenly see that change happening much later than it really happened. So it's slightly artificial to separate documents from objects in the case of money because somebody could make a transfer on credit at the same time as spending on coin, but actually you have to to untangle this quite complicated situation. But in terms of the themes of the, the seminar today, it's very clear that it's a global story despite being a question about a coin, essentially. So global impacts on the circulating currency at Zanzibar because of links to other commodities, especially cloth, but also in terms of the way I had to do this work. Because to put this story together and to not just come up with the same old idea that because there were Indian merchants, that's why the rupee came in. I had to use objects. I had to go to archives. I used old books, things like travelers' reports, geographers' accounts, language books, dictionaries. One of my favorite things at the moment is actually a book about Swahili in Gujarati script. And me and the, the curator who has Gujarati skills at the library spend happy times with her helping with the script and me knowing the Swahili, trying to work out what on earth this thing says. But those archives, the places where just the documents are found, are in four continents. Because this story involves the French, the Germans, the Americans, the British, and a lot of the records are also in India, because before the 1870s, 1880s, a lot of records are in the Maharashtra State Archives in Mumbai. So actually, you've got to be very global in your search for evidence to get to this kind of complicated story. Because if I'd have just worked in British archives and in the archives in Zanzibar, although there's amazing stuff there, I would have just come up with the idea that the British consul got the rupee into circulation which would have been quite a thin, boring, and bureaucratic point. Because actually, the more interesting point is the way this much bigger picture suddenly changed with the American Civil War. So that's sort of my point in terms of archives. And then just coming back to a point that was made in the previous session, there's a lot of air miles involved in doing this. So I have to end with thanks to the Levyhulme Trust, who funded a lot of the travel that made this possible. Thank you. <laughs>